Well, I really have, I, I guess there were kind of two questions, but I'll try to combine them into one because I think they're mm -hmm. actually kind of connected, which is the questions have to do with this. I described it, it's almost like a semantic question about whether we want to refer to what has happened in, in Gaza where Israel f said, hey, we're going to really bombard this northern region. You need to either evacuate or you are part of the enemy of Hamas mm -hmm. and whatever. So, you know, you had, what, over a million people in northern Gaza that had, on some level, had to leave. Of course, it's very difficult for hospitals, and we saw some of the consequences of that over the past several weeks. But the point is that, you know, there were hundreds of thousands of people that were walking, leaving in whatever way they possibly could to the southern uh, part of the Gaza Strip, which is a, a very small piece of land to begin with. Um, people have described this using the term second Nakba or... Uh, you know, I've heard that described uh, in that way. Um, I was listening to a recent interview that you did back at the end of November. I wish I could remember the name of the, um, it was like a radio program. And mm -hmm. um, in the way that it was framed, at least in the title of that interview, was the ongoing Nakba. Mm -hmm. So in a way, there's, I think, again, it's a semantic uh, question about semantics, but I do think it's in, it's it's important to kind of recognize that this is part of a larger process <laughs> that has been ongoing for quite a long time. And this is to ask you really about what, <laughs> you know, ignoring a lot of the propaganda about why Israel is engaging in this, this huge escalation of violence. What, I mean, what is the end game here? I think there's been a lot of speculation about, you know, what do you do with over 2 million people that are trapped in this, what has been called an open air prison or, you know, a, you know, an enclosed piece of land. I mean, like what, what comes next? I mean, that I, I think that to me is what, I'm having a hard time visualizing or trying to to, to imagine, um, and I just wanted to get your sense of of these right. things. Yeah, a couple things. Um, the first thing is the the people, most of the people who live in Gaza were driven there in 1948, or their or their parents and grandparents were driven there in 1948, driven out of areas that are now part of southern Israel, mm -hmm. and that's the original injustice, and that's the right. original the root of the problem. And if you don't talk about that, you're not talking about a very important aspect. The second thing is that ever since uh, about 2006-7, they haven't been able to leave Gaza freely. They've been penned up inside of Gaza. Um, you know, in the 1990s, people could move pretty freely between mm -hmm. Gaza and Israel, between the West Bank and Gaza, between anywhere inside Israel and the occupied territories. I mean, I lived in Jerusalem in the early 1990s, and driving a West Bank plate, a car with West Bank plates, you could go to the Golan Heights, you could go to Ilat, you could go to Gaza. Gazans worked in Israel. People moved freely. Over time, that freedom of movement has been restricted, and then severely restricted. And then it, the people in Gaza were essentially imprisoned. They could not go anywhere. Most of them never left the Gaza Strip over the last 15 years. You have a whole generation that's been born in Gaza, never allowed to leave Gaza. Mm -hmm. So that's a particularly severe form of restriction of movement that the, only the people of the Gaza Strip have been subjected to. Mm -hmm. And all of this is against a memory that Palestinians have, which has to do with one of the basic thrusts of Zionism, which is to create a Jewish state in a majority Arab country and, that, and to engineer tra demographic transformations to make that possible, reduce the number of Arabs, increase the number of Jews. That's always been a dynamic of Zionism. I mean, Herzl talked about it. Well, we will spirit the penniless population across the borders discre mm -hmm. discreetly. Mm -hmm. uh, that was his. That was his something in his that he wrote in his diaries. Um, other people had more forceful views about this, and ultimately, it was brute force that was used to do that. Palestinians are afraid of that, and so when Israel starts doing what it did during this war, which is to empty northern Gaza, which is where most people live in the Gaza Strip. Gaza City and the cities in the northern part of the Gaza Strip are where 75% of the population lived. All of those people, not all, but most of those people have been forced into the south. So that that forced displacement triggers these memories of displacement yeah. in 1948. Mm -hmm. And that everybody knows about. If they didn't, and it didn't happen to them, it happened to their parents or their grandparents. The second thing is, it was pretty clear that Israel's intention was to force as many of these people as possible out of the Gaza Strip and into the Sinai Peninsula, into Egypt. How do we know this? We know this because the US government essentially was carrying water for Israel. Secretary of State Blinken was running around as an errand boy for the Israelis, asking the Jordanians and asking the Egyptians if they would mind having a bunch of Palestinians booted 
into <laughs> Sinai and into Jordan. And mm -hmm. both of them rejected this out of hand. We know it plainly because there's actually a smoking gun. The Biden administration's request on the 20th of October to Congress for funding for Ukraine and Israel includes a provision for displacement of people from Gaza. Mm. So the government was going to finance what Israel was apparently intending to do. Mm. Expel as many people as possible from Gaza, from the Gaza Strip to reduce its population. Now, the Egyptians and the Jordanians refused, were enraged by this suggestion for various reasons. Uh, they knew perfectly well that when Israel kicks Palestinians out, they never return. This is not temporary and this is not humanitarian. It was intended to be permanent or would have become permanent. They also knew that it would have affected the security situation in their own countries. A lot of angry Gazans, many of whom are, are members of Hamas, being put in northern Sinai is going to create a problem. Finally, it would have changed the, in the terms of, of, of Sinai. Egypt would have lost sovereignty over part of its territory if a half a million Gazans were implanted there. Right. It would become Hamasistan or Palestinistan or something, but not right. Egypt. So Egyptian sovereignty would have been infringed. And the Egyptians just, they, they just rejected it out of hand. And, they re and they've said it again and again. And the Egyptian government has repeated this half dozen times. And finally, the president was forced to talking to, to the Egyptian president to say, you ha we have no intention of doing this. We wouldn't under any circumstances allow this. His government, his, his administration's Funding request is still before Congress. When Congress mm. adjourned, they had still not acted on that request. And it's in the language is in the request. Page 40 mm. uh, mm -hmm. of, of, of that, which is which is still before Congress. So this was not an imaginary fear on the part of the Palestinians. Uh, now it appears that the Egyptians and the Jordanians wouldn't allow it to happen. And the United States has backed off on it. And the Israelis haven't said anything about it recently either, though some Israeli leaders were talking about, you know emptying Gaza, turning it into a parking lot, whatever. Now they're not saying anything. But in, in light of, you know, people talk about how traumatic Jewish memory was triggered by the killing of so many civilians at the beginning of this uh, Hamas attack. And that certainly was the case, both in Israel and outside of Israel, in Jewish communities worldwide. Well, Palestinians have traumatic memories too. They're not the memories of the Holocaust, but right. they're memories of, of something that happened more recently. And which for them is going to influence the way they see sure. what's happening as, as a million and a half or a million and three quarters Palestinians are forced from their homes uh, by Israeli bombardments right. uh, from right. North Gaza to South Gaza, where they are still being bombed. I mean, people are being killed every day in the southern parts of Gama, Gaza by uh, the Gaza Strip by Israeli bombings. Right. Right. Yeah, it's... Um... I admit I don't know how to conclude this interview because it's just this ongoing. <laughs> it's like I mean I could you know ask you like where does this lead where does this go how do we act you know I don't know I I think that frankly because the U.S. is what it is and because of how much of a prominent role it plays in global affairs and specifically in this situation we're just we're talking about I do feel that it is you know if there if there's you know the, these um, efforts to really force the hand of U.S. politicians to do something about this is, is going to be a big part of this. Um, but it is quite striking how the Biden administration in particular, and Biden Biden in particular, has been so, his support of, of Israel is so adamant, so unwavering, really. I mean, yeah. in the in, you know, his, his, his election could be on the line as far as him being elected in 2024 or next year. It just seems like, because in part because of this issue, seems like he's just, you know, and I, I saw some video of him back when he was a senator decades ago, and he describes his support for Israel in really stark terms. He's like, if, <laughs> how did he say? He's like, if Israel did not exist, then we would have to create an Israel, you know? Right. Right. Um, He's described himself as a Zionist. He's said yes. many, many things along those lines yes. over the course of his very long political career. Right, right. Um, so, you know, as far as like a final note or question, I, I don't know what to say except that there has to be a multi-prong approach to really putting pressure. And I do think the raising of awareness and consciousness is part of that, but action, of course, is going to have to right. take place. And well, so, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, yeah. I do think, look, the first thing to say is this is something very far away and people may say oh this is foreign policy and this doesn't concern us that's false 
it's as close as can be because we are deeply involved. The weapons being used are American weapons. Uh, the United States gives Israel $3.8 billion a year in military assistance, free. They can come and buy any weapons off the shelf that they want uh, for $3.8 million. And Congress is increasingly bypassed by the administration. The kind of restraints that are supposed to be placed on U.S. weapons with Israel are usually not placed. Right. So we are directly involved as, as the United States. Our government, the, the Biden administration, has been completely supportive of everything Israel has done. This does not just include the killing of 20,000 people, most of whom are children and women. This also includes cutting off water and food and medicine and fuel and electricity to a population of 2.3 million people. Mm -hmm. Those are war crimes. And the United States has done absolutely nothing to reverse that situation. We haven't made them turn on the water or the electricity. The United States has a fleet sitting there in the Mediterranean. The United States could land tons of supplies if it wanted on the shores of Gaza. Uh, the United States could force Israel to do things if it wanted. The United States is complicit, in other words, directly yeah. involved because of its influence on Israel, because of its power in everything that happens, because of its wall-to-wall its -wall support for this Israeli military campaign. And we have a responsibility as Americans. This is being done in our name. The yeah. the. The, the planes that are being used to bomb Gaza are American planes. The artillery that's being used to shell Gaza, the 155 millimeter howitzers and the 175 millimeter guns, those are American. The helicopters are American. Most of the bombs and shells are American. We just shipped 14,000 tank shells over to Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, congressional approval was not required. They just, they, they bypassed Congress. Well, the American people are beginning, I think, to see some things about Gaza that they didn't, and public opinion is beginning. A majority of Americans want a ceasefire and have for yeah. weeks, and this administration is dead set against that. American people are smarter than their leaders. They showed that in the Vietnam War, and they showed that during the Afghanistan and Iraq, and Iraq wars. In all of those wars, the people understood these were bad things long before the president and his, the presidents and their various advisors admitted it. And I think that we have to push on this. Uh, this is bad for the United States. This is bad for, actually for Israel. They're just creating more enemies in the Middle East and especially in Gaza, but in Palestine generally. I mean, you kill this many people and you really think you've solved the problem right. and you have to kill this many people. In fact, they don't have to kill this many people. But for whatever reason, they are doing that. And that is creating for them and for the United States a sea of problems going into the future. And if they can't see that, they should be made to see it by the United States because it's harming the United States. Our, uh, the United States' reputation, for example, for upholding the rule of law is in tatters. Mm -hmm. Who will believe the United States complaining about <laughs> Russian occupation of Ukraine when we support 56 years of Israeli occupation? And who will uh, object to our, our, our protests about the bombing of Ukrainian hospitals? When Israel is using American weapons to bomb or otherwise attack hospitals in Gaza. I mean, the hypocrisy is stinks to high heaven for the rest of the world. And I think for ordinary Americans, and they should do something about it. Yes. Uh, I mean, it'll take a while. Our politicians are stubborn. They respond to all kinds of other pressures and pressures from the voters. You know, money, uh, uh, groupthink, whatever it may be. Um, but... Ultimately, they're forced to listen. I mean, LBJ was forced to step down. Uh, he didn't run in 1968 because public opinion turned against the war. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, from the early on in the Iraq war, public opinion turned against it. People realized this was not winnable. This was wrong. This didn't make any sense. There were no weapons of mass destruction. And I think that's beginning to happen over Gaza. Yeah. It's not an American war, but it's an American supported war. It's right. a war in which the United States has supported it to the hilt. And we ha I think I think that, that yes, getting getting more information about it, learning more about this issue, it's an American issue. It's not just an Israeli-Palestinian. Right. Issue. I think that's very important. Right. Yeah, and I think a lot of people are really, really making those connections. And that's it's been, uh, I don't want to say it provides hope, but it provides something. <laughs> it provides something. It's not yeah. a hopeful situation right now. No. I mean, the number of people who are dying, it just is... Yeah. The mind boggles and the suffering of people who don't have food or water. I mean, I have relatives. My, my niece has all of her in-laws are there. Mm -hmm. I mean, they write to us when there is electricity. It, 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 I mean, I can't, ex I can't possibly describe how horrific the conditions are for a couple of million people. Right. And we yeah. have done nothing to alleviate that or very little to alleviate. It.